Hi, everyone. I'm Janelle Orsi from Sustainable Economies Law Center. This is part three of a series called Nurturance Lawyering. And I'm so glad to see several people have come to all three, which is great because I weave themes throughout all of them. And this slideshow, which you're all going to have a link to, has links to the videos and the slides from the other two presentations. So you can go back and watch those plus several a uh, couple of articles here that you can enjoy. And then I'll come back and add the video to this presentation so that you can watch it again <laughs> if you want. So yeah, thank you all for being here. I was gonna give you an FYI that the bar recently changed the rules and added another hour of required training on elimin elimination of bias. So now lawyers need two hours every three years. And one of those hours needs to be about implicit bias. And so I was gonna just clarify in case anyone had any questions that this is not one of the implicit bias trainings. We did do one, however, in 2020, that's on our website and you can go back and watch that if you're gonna need your credit for the upcoming cycle. And, and I also emailed the bar just to verify that these older trainings on implicit bias will still qualify, even though the, we as a provider hadn't gone through the new requirements. And, and then I got this, email back, which I, I just direct pasted the email in so y'all can see it. I also feel like it may have been written by like one of those LOL cats, but in any case, I just thought y'all would find that helpful. So um, I want to say, I kind of feel like we're lucky to be able to talk about this because this is something that's happening all over the country. Folks might've heard at first, I didn't pay very much attention, but now I'm like, oh my God, um, all these different states have either passed the blue states or have proposed the purple states a law that is going to ban in k-12 through education and in some state agencies the discussion of things like bias and discrimination and histories of oppression so that's a little bit of our current context that we're in so i'm glad we get to talk about it I feel a little like I've become a quilter. I'm always kind of piecing together slides and weaving together different themes. And I wanna give a lot of due credit to just books that I've read recently that you know, every time I present, I'm kind of weaving together stuff that's feeling the most like compelling to me right now. So you'll see there's threads of some of these authors in here and I encourage you to come back and check out all these books. There's also, um, this is an essay I keep reading over and over again by Robin Wall Kimmerer, who's an indigenous biologist and wrote the beautiful book, Braiding Sweetgrass. And she's rewritten the introduction in this article. And one of the things that she says in it is this piece of the forces of creation and destruction are so tightly linked that sometimes we can't even tell, sorry, it gets cut off for me, tell where one begins and the other leaves off. So I provide that first because I feel like we are in a time of a lot of destruction and there's a lot that's kind of composting, decomposing. There's a lot of messes and I'm going to, I'm going to share a little bit more about the messes we're in. But before I do that, I also want to say it means to me something really powerful, which is that we are in a very creative time in history and that from this mess, we can grow many beautiful things together. So some of the content of this webinar is stuff that gets my heart pounding. Sometimes it makes me cry. It's like, this is heavy stuff. And I also want to say, this is also the stuff that gives me the most hope and energy. So a little bit of context of where we are now, which, which also to me feels like evidence that we need to start making bigger changes now. And, you know, one of them is, this is a graphic I drew of the the racial wealth gap between white households and black households. And the latest had been in 2013, you know, this incredible gap of white households having 13 times more wealth than black households. And, you know, I, I've been wondering like, where's it at now? Have things gotten better? Have things gotten worse? And, you know, what we're seeing is that the pandemic is laying the foundation for particularly the black and white wealth gap to get even worse. So we are on a tra trajectory of things like this getting worse. And I also wanted to put these faces here because, well, for many reasons, this is some of the context that we're in right now. And I think everybody here knows about the shooting that happened in Buffalo just recently. And it was a very, there was a, it was particularly racially motivated and the shooter had written all of this stuff um, that 
it's that, it was actually new to me, this concept of the great replacement theory, this idea that black people and other people of color are here replacing white people. And um, so, oh, you got the waiting room. I keep, all right, just wanna make sure catching it. Yeah, and that like for one of the things the shooter had written in this long manifesto is this idea that for every black person, no, that black people in the US are taking away $700,000 from each white person in the US that is costing each white person $700,000. So there's this idea that there's white people and people of color are replacing white people in their status and their wealth. So I've never heard of this replacement theory now, but I'm seeing it all over the news now. Um, and so I'm gonna weave back weave it back in and talk about how I think it relates to the legal profession. But I also want to put these faces here just because one of the things I have learned, and for those who came to my other sessions, you've heard me say this, which is just how important it is to feel our feelings. And I, I've learned a lot that it's so important to stop and grieve the losses because we're, we're facing a lot of loss. We've had a lot of loss. And I think a lot of us just sort of blow past the news and don't stop to grieve some of these losses and there's, you know, just many facets. Like if, imagine if you had, if one of these people is your best friend and you were gonna have them over for dinner tonight and now you can't. And there's also, just, you know, thinking about the whole community and what they're going through right now. And then for each of these people, the lives that they lost. And so I just wanna emphasize the importance of just stopping and taking time to grieve together. Cause one of the other things I've noticed is, you know, really supporting white supremacy in this society is a tendency for people and especially white people to not be grieving these kinds of losses. And it's one of the worst feelings to be grieving something and others around you are completely ignoring it. So I wanted to give that a little time and then this, oh my gosh. Okay, so this is a photo that was just in the LA Times, well, back in March. So another wave of legislation that's going around right now is this year, just in the last few months, there have been 240 bills introduced in state legislatures in 40 different states that are anti-LGBT in some way. About half of them relate to trans people and the other half a lot relate to education, what you're allowed to talk about in schools. And this particular photo just sent chills down my spine and I still just like, ooh, I shudder because I mean, it's first of all, there's just this display of homogeneity here. Like everybody looks the same. These young folks are probably young athletes, many of whom, some of whom could grow up to be queer. And, and they're kind of all standing here victoriously signing this bill that pushes aside and excludes people who are different, who don't meet this description. And to me, it's all part of the same trend of banning our discussion about race, trying to make anything that's deviant or non-conforming to just sweep it aside and push it to the margins or simply eliminate people. If, and you know, these bills do not happen every year. This is, a, this is a big year. And the other thing that it brings up for me is just how we're all losing in this moment. It's not just people of color, it's queer people, it's women, women who are forced or feel pressured to look like this. Anyways, I'm, you know, I'm sharing a lot of heavy stuff, but I think it's heavy stuff that, that we have to confront. I'm going to do one more and then I promise I'll give us a little bit of a breather from it. But just like this concept of replacement does not make sense to me in the, the realm of human society and in our wealth. But one of the things that is happening is that lush and wet lands around the world are being replaced by desert and are likely to continue to be replaced by desert. And that's the kind of replacement that we do need to be worrying about. And it, it also tells me there's gonna be growing scarcity and there's gonna be growing blame. Like when people start to experience the scarcity and they don't wanna blame climate change, they're gonna blame each other. And we're gonna fortify these boundaries that we've created around race and other things and continue to try to protect ourselves and blame others. So that was like my dose of reality. For me, these things are very motivating because I 
when I think about these things happening, it keeps me from tolerating slow reforms or half-baked solutions or false solutions. And so, um, but I also think it's important to kind of calm our nervous system. So I, will, I wanna invite us to take three deep breaths. And the rhododendrons are blooming. Thank you all. Um, see, I even get kind of shaken just by talking about these things, like physically in my body. It's like the reptilian brain is just sort of firing off and it, it cuts off our access to the other parts of our brain that are a little more thoughtful and feeling. So very important to calm our nervous systems. And what I was saying about grief and the importance of it, I also want to say there's this line from a Wendell Berry poem that I really love and it, it resonates me. He, he talks about going and, and being with the birds by, by a pond and talks about how they do not tax their lives with the forethought of grief. And so the forethought of grief is basically our anxieties, our fears, these fears we're walking around with all the time. And the way we tend to react to having anxiety and fear about things in the future that we can't control is we try to control them. But the only way to control the future is to control things now, i.e. people, places, things now. And so a lot of the harm that we're talking about here is caused by our fears. And if we were able to calm our fears, there would be less of this kind of harm. And so one of the conclusions that I come to is, and I come to in all of these webinars, is that we need each other. There's no replacement. There's no, the greatest wealth that we have and that we can create together is in each other. When we come together, we can create all kinds of wealth and well-being. It's not that one person takes it from another. We create it together and we really need each other to turn to each other, especially right now. So what does all that have to do with the legal profession? So here comes some my thoughts about the legal profession. So these specialty credits, you'll notice, you know, we've had three of three different ones. And I kind of feel like each of them is a little bit like a band-aid that the legal profession is putting on itself. And, you know, because they're trying to like clear up problems. And it's like we've seen so much bias in the legal profession and so much racial inequity that the profession is like, let's add one more Band-Aid, let's add one more credit. But, you know, like putting Band-Aids on wounds, it's not the best um, metaphor because wounds actually heal themselves. In nature, things do actually heal themselves. And so, but it's more like putting a Band-Aid on the Titanic because things, what we're seeing is things getting worse and worse and worse. And these Band-Aids are not transformative. They're not the kind of transformation that we need. So. What is the kind of transformation we need? I've been thinking about this a lot. I, I did a presentation on elimination of bias four years ago, and it was just striking to me how much I've changed the way I talk about it and think about it. Because four years ago, first of all, I used angry birds as the fun metaphor, that silly game where birds try to attack a castle and knock it down because pigs are hogging the castle and hogging their food. Anyways, that's the theme. And, you know, this idea that the profession has become so exclusionary that we need to start working on every one of these little pieces and kind of knock them down and bring them down to earth. And what I ended up doing in that presentation was just talking about all of these different things we could change, all the ways we can bring more people into the practice of law, all the ways we can make the practice of law and legal services more accessible and welcoming. And, um, I'm just not patient with all of these things anymore. These are small reforms. And so I'm, I'm now asking like, what are things that can be much more transformative now? Like, I feel like we need change now. And it's not enough for lawyers to just think we're doing some good things here around the edges. So one other thing that I've brought up in all of these presentations is just that this has become a guiding question in all of my work and um, yeah, it's just like, does this work? Does this act? Does it perpetuate separation and domination? Or does it foster connection and nurturance? And so those are my guiding questions kind of in life. 
So I wanna talk about the separation and domination and how it shows up. And I'm gonna have parallels between the construction of whiteness and race and the construction of the legal profession and the practice of law. Like how do we define those things as a, in order to be able to separate them out from other things? And I'm gonna talk about land ownership too. It may not be an immediately intuitive why that is relevant, but I think it's another set of definitions we've created around this concept of land and ownership that are all part of one larger, very harmful project. So let's talk a little bit about race and whiteness. I wanna just make sure I can watch the time here. Um, we've actually taught a CLE before about the invention of whiteness and how it's changed so much over time. And there was just all these ridiculous rules about who got to be white because whiteness came with so many privileges, legal, legally enforced privileges um, and property that are protected by our legal system and protected specifically through violence and policing at the end of the day. So this question, even though it's like, when you think about people in the world, it's like, there's no such thing as race. There's just people everywhere intermixing all colors, all cultures, you know, but to try to create this as a thing with boundaries became very important. And so it became this very complex set of rules in order to create those lines. So another fake and fuzzy line that we encounter a lot is this question of what is the practice of law? And if you look at the definitions in different states, it tends to say uh, it includes, you know, representing people in tribunals, but also giving legal advice. And it, you, I just laugh every time I see a publication trying to distinguish legal advice and legal information. I'm just like, you can't do it. And I... I've drawn other cartoons about it before and just like, yeah, people always try to say legal advice. Well, it's tailored to the needs of a person. You know, you're giving them information, but it's tailored to their needs. That's different than information. That's just, what is it? If it's not related to what they need, then it has to be irrelevant to what they need. It's just a really silly, like if you try to figure out what is or isn't legal advice, um, it's kind of like I was thinking about when, um, my parents were teaching me how to drive and they would tell me like, oh, you can turn left on a one-way street if, you know, they're giving me the rules that they, while I was driving the car, were giving me legal advice. It's information about the law that was tailored to my needs. And so it's so silly to act like you can draw a line around any of this. And this is what the legal profession does. It does it in many places. If you start to look around, you'll find there's so many lines I mean, the whole legal system, so much of it's based on definitions. And so much of what we do as lawyers is argue the gray areas of those definitions and end up finding that they're, they're just not lines, they're slippery. So this is my caution, beware of things that really aren't things, things that we try to put in a box, but we really can't. And it becomes very complicated to do so. And it tends to indicate that what's happening underneath. Why are we going to all this trouble to create a thing? It's a strategy to own and control things that really shouldn't be owned and controlled. So I'll give some examples. And also say, there's the good news is that other things, other living things on earth don't do this. Like they don't feel this strong need to define things and control things. You know, the mushrooms are not like, I'm a mushroom, you're a different mushroom. They might be the same mushroom. They're, not, they're just not worried about it. And so we have a lot to learn from nature about how to just kind of live in a more interconnected way. But we can learn a lot from ourselves too. Like we, as human beings, and through our feelings, which are very powerful tools, can understand the, the violence of artificial borders and boundaries. There's a, when we turn off our thinking brains, cause it's our thinking brains, these conceptual brains that are like, that's a thing, that's a thing. We put our things in our conceptual boxes but actually just feel into what right, what feels right. And what, we look around and we feel like, oh, that, that, that hurts. We see borders and boundaries all around us that just don't feel fair or right. So in my prior uh, webinar, I talked about how important it is to feel our feelings. And this is another reason it's our moral compass. And it's our path back to kind of a more accurate picture of reality. Um, so, so why do we create these things? Why do we go to all this trouble? 
So around the creation of whiteness, a lot of people, I, I wanna say critical race scholars have written a lot of great things on this. I've been reading a little bit of W.E.B. Du Bois lately. And some people talk about whiteness. So it's like, once we've created it and people really want to have it, why do they really wanna have it? A lot of critical race theorists talk about whiteness as a, it's like a property, it's a thing that we own and it's very valuable thing to have. W.E.B. Du Bois kind of, it talks about it more expansively as like, it's not just that, it's also that whiteness comes with this presumption that you can own things. Whiteness means you have the ability to own and control other things, whereas other people don't. And in fact, they are the ones who are controlled by you. And he says, amen. And, and, he, and he really kind of like makes fun of also just like the level of kind of uh, like, it's like almost like it's a religion or a cult, the way that we've constructed whiteness, because we, we don't just try to come up with definitions about who's in and who's out. We try to especially control the people within and create these kind of images of pure heterosexual nuclear families with women who are controlled and and pretty girly girls as a way to kind of like protect the sanctity of this thing, this thing called whiteness. Um, so yeah, that's whiteness. Um, and yeah, a little bit more about what does it mean to own a thing? Like we learned in law school, ownership is a bundle of rights. Um, and so it, it is, it means that you get to control things, but there's, and, and we tend to think of ownership as a somewhat benign thing. People own land and, um, well, people own land, for example. And we tend to think of that as a good thing that we should all strive to do, but it's not just benign. It's not just that you get to go control that land. You get to exclude others from it. Um, and you, once you own it and control it and having excluded other people from it, you now you're, you, you have that fear of replacement. You can't let other people trespass onto it and, and take it away from you. So that replacement, tendency or fear comes up. But the thing that I really started to think about lately that feels key to me is it's not just you, that you control the land, you control others because we're forcing other people not only to be excluded, but to lose the means of their own survival. And then to say, control their labor to, to say, well, you can come back and work on the land um, and I will pay you. Um, but yeah, the more we take away from people, the more we control them. And so that's to me like one of the like, most insidious things about ownership. And so land, the, land is another thing to, that to me is not a thing. And it was such an aha moment when I realized this, it, you know, as a real estate lawyer, I used to kind of think it, it was a thing. It was like, you put land in you know, a square parcel and then you could sell it with all the things that are physically attached to it. And that is land. That's how the law more or less defines land. But it, when you start to think, well, what does that include? Does it include like the fish that swim through it, the people who breathe the air produced on it, the animals that pass through it, the people who have long-term affectionate relationships with it, who take care of that land or are fed by that land. That's a whole web of relationships that gets severed when we put land in a box. And we use all these rituals. This is where W.E. Du, Bois, du Bois was sort of like making fun of whiteness as this sort of cult. Land ownership is also this kind of cult. And we use all these funny rituals to make it so. Like we have a deed that has extra lines on it that makes it look extra official to say somebody owns this now and can exclude others from it. And then we have like notaries. Did you know that Christopher Columbus arrived in 1492 in the Americas with a notary? Because to him, that was a very important way to be able to take ownership of land is to have like this official person sign an official document and say, well, we showed up, nobody owned the land, so now the king and queen own it. And so it's a lot of rituals. And the result of all of that is that 98% of rural land is owned by white people and homeownership rates, I mean, it, it's getting worse. I mean, compared to back, you know, when, the, when there was redlining and more direct land theft through predatory lending, it's just gotten worse and worse, the racial gap, even in just homeownership. And so, this is how like all these different things are connected, the construction of race, the use of the law, um, the control of the law and control of land. And we you know one other fake thing that we all know about is corporations, another made up thing that allows us to put our things in those things and then exempt us individuals as from responsibility when we or our things hurt other things. 
And so it's just all of these constructions that lawyers are create. And we lawyers have a monopoly on the practice of law, even though it's such a fuzzy thing that is hard to define. Lawyers have been able to mostly intimidate other people from coming and trying to cross that blurry line. And by holding that monopoly, um, lawyers have this ability to charge rent, that being the amount above and beyond what would be the actual cost of them providing legal services, like the cost of their livelihood. Um, is the amount we can charge above and beyond is, we'll call it rent. And here's from Wikipedia, the, some of the largest uh, earning law firms in the world. Um, and so there's some partners in this one, like the top firm who earn 5 million a year, revenue per lawyer, 1.6 million a year. That's rent. I can't believe we have a rule that says lawyers can't charge unreasonable fees, but we never look at it in the aggregate and say, wait, are these folks serving our society or are they extracting from it? You know, sometimes when there's unfair systems or some people are able to, you know, game the system and win and lose, we think, well, at least everyone can play the game. But no, it's not the case. Lawyers, lawyers are really not representing the diversity of US society and it's getting worse and worse and worse. So if you look at the number of lawyers who are white and the change um, over the last 20 years, it's changed by about 3%. So 86% of lawyers are now white but 58% of the population is white. This is a massive disparity and it's not keeping up with changes in society at large. And then it's like, well, okay, well, if 86% of lawyers are white, okay, so the, what about the 14% who may be people of color? Okay, so they got into the profession, but who are they working under? L looking at the hierarchies, um, you know, just the st statistics about who are the partners, the, ma the managing partners, 93% of, law firm, or at least at the top 100, um, managing partners are men, 93%. 92% of equity partners are white. Um, so even though there's maybe a little bit of growing diversity within the profession, there's this incredible hierarchy of control. And so the legal profession is the number one least diverse profession. And I was wondering like, is there something unique about the legal profession? that makes it the least diverse. And I'm like, yeah, the legal profession is the one that creates things, creates boundaries and defines things, and then works extremely hard to keep others out. It is a profession of exclusion and it is doing a really good job at it, better than any other profession. Just you know, a couple other rituals and um, things that upset me. <laughs> feelings. I'm feeling some feelings about the bar exam. Anytime I know someone has to take the bar exam, I'm just like, no, don't let this precious soul have to go through that. And um, yeah, so there's you know feelings about the bar exam. So here's some interesting feelings, thoughts people have had about the, the bar exam in California, which is that, you know, the, the passage rate for a while was really low. Like in 2016, one exam, the passage rate was 43%. So most people taking the bar were not passing becoming lawyers, even after going to law school or apprenticing. After all that, they're not being let in. So then the bar surveyed lawyers and said, hey, all y'all, 40,000 40, of them responded. I think we, we were obligated to respond, but in, in any case, surveyed lawyers and said, hey, y'all, should we increase the passage rate? Should we change, like lower the score and thereby increase the passage rate so more people can get in and be lawyers? 80% said no. 80% were like, keep out. We're not going to let more people into this profession. You know, incidentally, the ones who hadn't taken the bar exam yet, the ones who had applied to take it, they were also surveyed and 90% of them said, yes, please increase the passage rate. So it's like, okay, once we get over this line, which is the most ridiculous line, what is the bar exam? Stuff that we mostly don't use, memorization, which we almost never have to, you know, spit out rules from memory in the actual practice of law a two to three day exam that's so rigorous. It's just like, it is a, it is a, like a, it's like a torture device. It's just like cult like torture device that doesn't necessarily tell us who is gonna be a good lawyer. So it's this weird line, but once people pass it, it's like something happens to their brain where they suddenly feel very entitled to protect that boundary and, and own that thing that they have earned, the law. Um, so yeah, lawyers, 
This great replacement theory, it's all over the legal profession. Lawyers do not want to let others in. They are fiercely designing every part of the legal system, the language of the law, the court system, everything is designed to keep people out. So they're fiercely protecting this. So one of the things I wanna say is it's just time to end the profession's monopoly at the very least on the practice of law. We have granted lawyers this incredible privilege and in exchange lawyers were going to in, you know, hold the law in trust for the benefit of society and the legal profession has failed and created all these kinds of disincentives that are just building up that fortress. So we need to end the monopoly. But then people are like, you know, I'm sure everyone's here is thinking this, but you know, then if anybody could practice law, think of the people who are in need, like maybe they need eviction defense or, you know, maybe they're a defendant in a criminal proceeding and they could go to prison. Like the stakes are high. We need competent representation for them. Well, first there's this belief that the profession, the state bar is actually um, the one that helps people be competent. But there's also this, this word that we've talked about in prior sessions, this word compete is right there and the word competent and this implicit in it is this idea that someone is gonna come and fight for you. The stakes are high. You could go to prison if you do not get good legal representation, but who the hell like, made the stakes so high? It's all part of that same system, a system where we even think prisons are a good idea, a system where we don't even protect everyone's basic right to have housing, or a system where of deep hierarchies and workplaces where people don't control the conditions of their own work. That's the system we've created and that lawyers have helped create. And so, yeah, we feel like people need competent lawyers because the stakes are so high, but then it's like, who made the stakes so high? It's all this larger project. And at the root of it, is the very harmful exclusion of people and the severing of relationships with land. Because that is like one of the ultimate losses that people can have is to, to lose their land, to lose their home, to lose their relationship to land, to be forced off of land into say factory work where they have no control over their labor. But okay, so I'm, you know, there's a lot of heavy stuff. It's very bad news for the profession. But I really feel like it's such good news for us as human beings, because we're the ones who are like contorting ourselves into these boxes and it doesn't feel good. We don't feel good about ourselves. We know how many lawyers are struggling with mental health and substance abuse. These boxes are not good for us as humans. And so this is where, you know, I start to turn to, well, what can we do? And, um, you know, this theme, nurturance lawyering that I've woven throughout, nurture to me means connecting with others and creating connections of care with them. And I really think the lo nurturance lawyering is a, it's kind of a oxymoron. Yeah, it's an oxymoron just because I feel like the very concept and definition of lawyers is something that's meant to exclude and sever relationships. Nurturing connections is, it's crossing those borders and saying, hey, those were not helpful boundaries and borders. It's blurring the boundaries. I think this is what we need to do is start calling out these artificial lines wherever we see them. And because we are trapped in these boxes in so many ways in our lives, we need to be taking bigger leaps out of them. We can't just start to soften the edges of them with little reforms. We need to be taking bigger leaps. So, if you've been thinking of making any big changes in your life or work lately, now would be a good time. This is, there's so much urgency and there's so much possibility. If we let go of those old boxes and start turning to one another and saying, okay, what can we do differently here? And I think that is the thing, it is gonna nurture us as humans. It's gonna help our hearts. And that's why I say, this is like it's bad news for the profession, but really good news for our human hearts. Another thing is to just reject power and pay hierarchies wherever you see them. And of course, if you look around, you see them everywhere. Almost every workplace has power and pay hierarchies. But again, these are systems of separation of roles and responsibilities and of domination of over people and their labor. Giving law back to the people in every way we possibly can. I mean, we, we can end the monopoly on the practice of law, but we also need to make the law something that people can actually practice and engage with and understand and use. And then as far as the actual work that we do as lawyers, I mean, there's a lot of good work that we can be doing, but I thought I really also wanna comment on the content of our practice. What are we choosing to support as lawyers? And because of this interconnected system of whiteness 
and land ownership and the legal profession, these, all of these boxes we've created to exclude people and to harm people. It's so important to be supporting black and indigenous and immigrant land ownership, land stewardship. And these are some of those, the sustainable economies, law centers, clients. And I start to picture this web of projects growing all over California. And it's like, I wanna see the state covered in this. I want this to become the new normal and just break out of those boxes entirely. And so I kind of feel like this is what we need to be doing is looking around and seeing where people are organizing and seeing where people are saying, we need land. We wanna create climate resilience centers. We wanna create cooperative housing, particularly black indigenous and immigrant communities or any people of color owned land projects. Cause like I said, 98% of rural land is owned by white people. So the actual content of our work matters. What we are actually supporting matters. And just continue to listen and learn together. This is just sort of, today is sort of like the product of a lot of my listening and learning and talking with others in recent times. Um, there's so much wisdom out there that we can learn from, but also just learn with each other. It's not an individual act of sort of decolonizing our minds. There's individual work to do, but so much of it is this learning about how to rely on each other again. That is perhaps the core lesson. And yeah, like I said, it doesn't feel to me like a sacrifice. It feels like this is exactly what I want to move toward is nurturing these connections with others, with these land projects. And that this is actually gonna sustain me no matter how scary the world is, that this is gonna feed me. So I wanna invite people into small groups. We'll make groups of three. And this is your cue, Sue, to um, create the breakout rooms. And I know I've just shared a lot really in small groups, you're welcome to just kind of just say what came up for you during the presentation. You could just say how you're feeling. You don't even have to have a thought. You can just say how you're feeling. Because <laughs> like I said, it's important to be in touch with those things. Or yeah, what did it bring up? What did it bring up ideas? Did it make you think, hmm, there's some changes I want to make or actions I want to take or even big leaps? Um, and yeah, how can we turn to one another and do this?